Okay, before we start with today's filler video, I've got a quick disclaimer for all of you. If you're having frame rate issues or slowdown with various games, there can be a massive number of reasons why it's happening. What I'm about to talk about is only one such potential reason, but it's one that the average person and even some game developers don't know about because it deals with a part of Windows which many of us just take for granted. The scheduler. Not the task scheduler, but the system scheduler. To understand what this is and why it can have such a huge effect on game performance under the right circumstances, we need to talk about Windows in the early days. If you scroll back to the 90s and some of the early 2000s, most CPUs only had a single core. This meant that a CPU was only capable of running one process at a time. But Windows is a multitasking operating system, even Windows 3.1, which some people will argue doesn't qualify as an OS, but it's still capable of running multiple applications all at the same time. So if the CPU can only process one thing at a time, how is this even possible? And that's where the scheduler comes into play. The system scheduler in Windows has one sole purpose in life, to decide which programs or services get to use the CPU and for how long. The whole system works on the principle of priorities. In fact, some of you may be familiar with the notion of changing a program's priority to settings like low or above normal. And you may also be aware that manually setting a thread to real-time priority is often a really bad idea. See, all threads at a higher level of priority must enter an idle state before threads of a lesser priority are allowed to function. Thus, if you promote something which doesn't idle in any way to a real-time priority, the rest of the system gets starved for CPU power, and you'd likely lock everything up. But there's one little aspect about the scheduler which is somewhat evil, even though it's not going to seem like it at first. See, the scheduler itself needs to use CPU power to do its thing. So, to minimize the amount of power wasted by dishing out unnecessarily large quantities of time slices, as they're referred to, it typically defaults to running about once every 10 to 20 milliseconds, depending on your hardware and power management settings. Though it can run as fast as every 1 millisecond, or when running in a power saving mode to preserve battery life, it can be running just once every 50 milliseconds or longer. Now, under most circumstances, the rate the scheduler runs at really doesn't make a difference. Many aspects of Windows function on an event handler, meaning that when a program is idling, its idle state can be interrupted by various events, such as by pressing a keyboard button, or when a time limit expires, or when a printer finishes printing. Basically, most software is completely unaffected by the rate the scheduler runs at. And in the early days of Windows, that included games. This traces back to the single core nature of old CPUs. Many games have to update their states constantly, usually to draw a new frame of gameplay, and many older games were pushing the boundaries of what the CPUs of the time were capable of. So the notion of idling a game program was ludicrous. So old games were developed to use as much CPU power as they could, but they still had to play nice with the multitasking nature of Windows. And the way this was done was by adding a Windows sleep command into the game loop and passing it a value of zero milliseconds. Now, normally the sleep command idles a program for a specific number of milliseconds, but passing a value of zero simply has it give up the remainder of its current time slice to other programs of an equal priority. But now let's take you into the world of 2 GHz CPUs and multi-core processors. CPU power continued to increase considerably, but graphics processors were starting to take the heat off the CPU to do the rendering, and it rapidly got to the point where CPUs were way more powerful than the games needed them to be. If you scroll back to the mid-2000s, you'll often find complaints of games racing the CPU, using 100% CPU power or the entirety of a single core, and draining batteries on laptops way faster than anticipated as a result. And those old games weren't made to run on such powerful systems, so they end up consuming more CPU power than they need to because they're not attempting to do any idling. Naturally, modern games do perform idling in order not to burn excessive amounts of CPU power, and this is what brings us back to the system scheduler, and more importantly, the rate it runs at. When a thread goes into an idle state, it can only be woken from that state in one of two ways. Either it receives an interrupt from an external event, or the scheduler wakes it back up after the period of time it's requested to stay idle for has expired. Now, Generally speaking, since games have to update themselves numerous times a second, there's not really any non-time related events which can do the job. So modern games will often have sleep commands in their game loops to set an idle of about 1 to 10 milliseconds, which is perfect for keeping the CPU from racing and to maintain 60 frames a second. 
There's just one problem. If you put a command in your program to idle for one millisecond, expecting the scheduler to wake it back up following, but the scheduler is only running once every 20 milliseconds, which is very possible on a modern gaming rig, that means the program's actually going to idle for as long as 20 milliseconds, because the scheduler's not running fast enough to detect exactly one millisecond of idling. Well, let me show you guys a couple examples of this. Here we have the ZSNES emulator running a copy of Final Fantasy II, aka Final Fantasy IV. Now, you need to be watching this video at 60 frames per second to notice this, but this should be an absolutely silky smooth 60 FPS, and yet it's not. There's little annoying glitches in the frame rate which prevents it from being perfectly smooth. Now, this is because ZSNES is trying to idle itself when it doesn't need the CPU power, but because of the rate the scheduler typically runs at on my system, it's routinely idling for just barely longer than a single frame, thus causing it to jitter. Here's a far more noticeable example in the indie game Zotrix. Now I've put two examples side by side. The one on the right is how the opening sequence of this game is supposed to run. However, the game speed is tied in with the frame rate, as often happens with a lot of games since it's easier to write logic and rendering intermixed with each other rather than to separate them. In any case, the telling thing about this intro sequence is it has a countdown timer which is based on the system timer up in the top corner. So, no matter how slow this intro runs, the timer up top counts down at the proper rate. Now, when the scheduler is set to run faster than default, the sequence completes normally. But at the default scheduler rate on my computer, as shown on the left, it actually goes for way longer than it's supposed to. Now, since I'm showing side-by-side -side footage from the same computer, clearly it's possible to fix this. And you guys will be very surprised how simple it is. All you have to do is run a program in the background, which alters the scheduler rate. And see, because the system scheduler is responsible for handling everything to do with multitasking, it can't really run at two rates at the same time. So instead, programs are able to make a call to a function called time begin period. And what this does is feed a new timing rate to the scheduler. If the rate input is faster than the fastest rate currently set, it'll speed up to run at the new speed. Now, programs which alter this are also required to make an equivalent call to time end period when they're done so that the new rate that they input can be removed from the scheduler, which will then go back to whatever the previous fastest rate was. You may have also noticed that this footage was captured by pointing my camcorder at my monitor. Well, that's because I normally use Open Broadcaster to capture game footage. And wouldn't you know it, OBS happens to be one of the programs which sets a faster scheduler rate. It doesn't have to be doing anything, all you have to do is run OBS and you're set. The faster scheduler rate will be implemented, and problems related to programs idling more than they should will be gone. Now, having OBS running in the background was the only difference between these two captures of game footage. In fact, here's ZSNES with OBS running in the background. Now, it does glitch out a little at the start because CPU time can still be temporarily pulled away by higher priority threads, but this is running a lot smoother than it was a moment ago. Now, some of you might be asking, well, why not just always run the scheduler at a high refresh rate? And the answer comes back around to the fact that the scheduler itself uses CPU power. Well, even though it's not much, it will make a difference in terms of things like laptop battery life. So running the scheduler at a high rate all the time isn't necessarily a good thing. Now, this is why it's best for games to set new rates themselves, do their gameplay stuff, and then go back to a previous rate following. But again, you'd be surprised how many people, including programmers, are unaware of this aspect of how Windows works. For instance, Game Maker. Now, I can't speak to the latest versions of Game Maker, but versions as recent as the one used to make Undertale fail to set a higher rate, which means running the majority of games made with Game Maker at 60 FPS on a Windows system can result in jittery frame rates for some people. Unless you run something else in the background like OBS, which will set a higher scheduler rate. Although funnily enough, there is one other potential solution which doesn't require changing the scheduler rate, but it requires the game not to do any idling on its own accord when this is set up. And that solution is vertical retrace synchronization, often referred to as VSync. Since the mid-2000s, most graphics cards do what's referred to as a non-busy vertical sync. This means that when a game puts in a request to the GPU for a VSync, the game's actually going to go into an idle state, but with a very specific interrupt set, that interrupt being the vertical retrace signal coming back from the graphics card. 
Again, this comes back around to how threads in an idle state can only be woken up in one of two ways, being woken up by the scheduler itself, or from an event. In this case, a vertical sync event. Now, if a game is programmed well, then activating vSync should be disabling any other idling the game is normally attempting to perform, since it's unnecessary and may hurt the frame rate. But this does rely on the game being programmed to do this right, and some may not be. Not to mention, if your graphics drivers aren't set up very well, you might get a surprising amount of lag from using vSync, which you can alleviate by reducing the flip queue size on the Radeon side of things, or the number of pre-rendered frames on the GeForce side of things. Although even then, there's a small number of people out there who can't tolerate even a single frame of lag at 60 frames per second. And if you're one of those people, then vSync is not going to be the answer for you. But yeah, I just wanted to put a video together talking about this because it's a topic I didn't know a whole lot about myself for the longest time. And it was only during the development of Textmo 2000 that I started to clue in to just how important this was nowadays, since it was never a factor back in the 90s and early 2000s. And this is also what led to TM2K having multiple sync modes since I was still learning and was presenting the options I felt made sense given what I knew at the time. Generally speaking, if you're a Windows game programmer making a game that can run 60 frames per second, absolutely make sure you're setting the scheduler to run as fast as it can when you start it up, using the time begin period function, and removing the change at the end of the program by calling time end period. Or if you're just trying to play a game and you think this might be the cause of your frame rate issues, just load up Open Broadcaster and see what happens. You might be pleasantly surprised. Or not. Again, frame rate issues can be caused by lots of different things, so this isn't necessarily the answer that you're looking for. It's just one that a lot of people aren't aware of, and I'm hoping that this video makes more people aware of it, so that it'll be less of a problem in the future. In any case, that's all for this filler. So stay tuned for episode 221 of Ancient DOS Games. It's going to be on Saturday, September 2nd, and I'll be covering a game that lets you design your own castles. Yeah, there's not a lot of games with that kind of feature, so be sure to send your guests to ADG at pixelships.com and stay tuned as our trek through DOS gaming continues. Thanks for watching, everyone, and special thanks to those of you supporting me on Patreon. Here's just a small sample of you guys. 